We invited her. This because of her work on the semantics and syntax of deafness and her program of research seeking to expand and test this understanding on a large variety of languages. So we asked her about uh, the one learner, and this is what she <laughs> I probably don't have the actual review anymore, but my first major journal, major, uh, major journal article, The Syntax and Semantics of Correlatives, published in Natural Language and Linguistic Theory, 1991, was reviewed while I was a student in very negative terms. The one liner was effectively, she should stop doing linguistics. It was a senior South Asianist and she knew me. Needless to say, I didn't stop doing linguistics. That was me, Adam. And more significantly, correlatives shifted from being an exotic construction to something whose formal properties are now well known and attested in a wide range of languages as a type of construction in which relative clauses do not modify the law, but rather quantify over that. So there. <laughs> so that's it. Professor Cantalaya. I do want to look up the review because you know how kids hear things that never were said? <laughs> so it's probably something like that. I like probably said this argument doesn't go through, it should be fixed. <laughs> Thank you. And let's get it started. So, uh, human beings have the ability to, they conceive of uh, individuals at two levels. One is an abstract kind level, so we talk about species, some kind of abstraction, but we also talk about the kinds of individuals that we actually bump into in our experiential life, so the instantiations of the kind, and there's clearly some connection between them. And this ability to speak at two levels actually starts very early in uh, language, you know, you see very young children get this distinction. And natural language reflects this fact, because as far as I know, every known language has the ability to talk about things at two levels. Individuals more abstractly, like species or kinds, and individuals, the here and now type of individuals. Interesting questions arise when you start looking at the morphosyntactic packaging of these, uh, a little bit so I see the side of the room. So when you see the morphosyntactic packaging, of how these thoughts are expressed, the thoughts about abstract objects and thoughts about concrete objects. And um, these questions arise even when you look, certainly when you look across languages, but sometimes even within a single language. So that's what I'm going to be talking about to give you a sense of where the uh, talk is going. In, uh, in the uh, first section, I just want to discuss what is a term that refers to kinds, what is the, uh, this ability to talk about individu individuals at this higher level. And in doing so, we'll only, and, and the relationship to the instantiation. So there's some connection, obviously, with the abstract objects are always connected in some sense to the concrete objects. But uh, in talking about this, we'll see that there's some distinctions. There's more than one way of referring to these sorts of abstract objects. And we we'll just stick with English because English provides us with some um, with enough food for thought. In the second section, I want to talk about the uh, role of definiteness marking, whether it's overtly definite or indefinite, and whether the language marks number in the nominal system. So whether you you have plural, the singular plural distinction between them. And in uh, talking about what questions those raise, this, these two ways of marking, or overtly marking, or queuing us into uh, definiteness and number, I'll be talking about English, Hindi, Urdu, which is no, not a language at all. <laughs> it's Hindi and Urdu, it's just one language, so linguists call, call it Hindi, Urdu. So when I talk about Hindi, I need both. And uh, I'll be talking about Italian and other Romance languages. And in the third section, I'll talk about pair entries, entries that don't have any overt mark of definiteness, and their relationship to an indefinite reading. So, I mean, the term definite, indefinite has a kind of morphosyntactic life and a kind of interpretive life. So I'm going to talk about the connection between the two. 
And here I'll be talking about uh, English, Hindi, Urdu, and Mandarin. They differ on whether they have uh, number marking or not in the system, but they all allow paired entries. So that's going to be the, um, the, the three uh, pieces of my talk. And I'll try to connect what we get from the linguistics literature with uh, some of the literature that I know of in the area of experimental philosophy, psychology, and psycholinguistics. Obviously, that, that's an attempt to connect, but maybe there are more questions raised than answers. Okay, so starting off. Also, as you can see, I don't have many slides, so feel free to interrupt me with questions of clarification. And I get to decide whether they're questions of clarification or <laughs> Okay. So, first of all, uh, again, it may be obvious, but it doesn't hurt to think about what does it mean to be a kind term, a term that re with reference to kinds. Well, uh, a lot of the data I'm drawing on comes from an old, old work that I'm still impressed by. Carlson's work on reference to kinds from 1977, and the overview article in uh, the generic book uh, by Cliff Guy Hall in 1995. So the fact that there's, there are predicates that tell you we can only talk about individuals that are abstract. So you, a single individual or the kinds of tigers we are likely to see on a safari are not that single. Uh, those concrete entities are not endangered. It's the species as a whole that's endangered. Extinct is also a predicate, that's a kind level predicate. And we can use bare plurals to refer to them, uh, to talk about them. So we can say tigers are an endangered species, they could become extinct. And we can also talk about their instantiations, properties that their instantiations have. So tigers have stripes, it's, in a way the species has it too. But it derives from the fact that the concrete, enough concrete entities have that property. Similarly, you know, tigers roam freely in the wild, and there's a lot to be said about that, but I'm really interested in the distinction right now. But bare plurals are not the only way of referring to kinds. I can also say the tiger is an endangered species, and the tiger could become extinct. And again, it refers then this seems synonymous, right? Just two ways of saying one seems more natural, what we use in um, everyday conversation. The definite singular, sometimes people balk at it, but then the next thing you hear them using it, so I don't mind that. Um, and again, you can also have the same uh, proper, uh, concrete entities associated with them with that property. So the tiger has stripes, the tiger roams freely in the wild. But not so one distinction that I want to make is that reference to kinds, my talk is called genericity because it flows better, right? but reference to kinds is distinct from genericity. So there are now phrases that participate in generic uh, predication very happily. So the indefinite, the singular indefinite in, in English, a tiger has stripes, a tiger roams freely in the wild, of course, does refer to tigers in general, even though it's an, um, you're using a single indefinite, but it does not participate in kind level predication. So you cannot say a tiger is an endangered species except on a taxonomic reading, you know, a certain uh, type of tiger. A tiger could become extinct. So what I'm really interested in is the first two, those that are really referring to kinds. Okay. And now, are they the same? Are they distinct? So here is one uh, observation that's been in the literature. Both of these observations in different forms have been there. There's a sense in which the definite singular kind term has a propensity to, but it evokes a well-established kind. What makes a well-established kind is a little up for grabs. I can talk a little bit about that. But you can all, you can take any non-modified noun phrase as a bare plural, and once you use a bare plural, you may impose some regularity to it, some kind like flavor to it, but it's not as if you have to think of, oh, this is a well established, you know, oh yeah, there are three legged tigers. So that's one uh, generalization that has been there in the literature. The other one is that somehow the connection between the instantiation and the kind is 
something more definitional about the, uh, the, bear, uh, the definite singular. So Rutgers, this was uh, a sentence given to me, a pattern given to me by Edwin Williams. You know, if somebody is recording, I was at Rutgers then, so, and the book was at Rutgers. So, you know, you're recording, just filling in data, and at some point someone says, oh, Rutgers professor seemed to be born on weekdays, how odd. But you cannot say the Rutgers professor seems to be born on a weekday. Even though this is not about being well established, because you can say the Rutgers professor is very hardworking, or the Rutgers professor has different challenges from the Yale professor, so whatever. So you can, the, the noun phrase is well established, but it's the predication that seems to be, there doesn't seem any essential connection between the two. Um, so what is this uh, bear, the definite singular? That's, I think we know a lot about bear plurals. A lot of it was already said in, the, in Carson's work and we have refined it. Somehow the definite singular has had less attention paid to it. But it is, a, it is a, in some sense plural. It's conceptually plural. So you can say lions are widespread. You can also say the lion is widespread. And widespread obviously requires plurality. You can say lions surround their prey before attacking. The lion surrounds its prey. People will accept it in the sense that a single lion doesn't do the surrounding. And um, lions gather near acacia trees when it is tired. So does the lion. Okay. So there's clearly this abstract singular, definite singular has a life that connects it to more than to a multiplicity of objects, which is sort of what makes it a kind of term, right? But here's where they come apart. There are some predicates that are not happy with just conceptual plurality. They really want to pull out <laughs> some plural instantiation and talk about them. So dogs lick each other, perfectly acceptable. But the dog lick, licks each other is just out. <laughs> um, unicorns have horns. We all know that they have a, a, a single unicorn has one horn. And so these are what uh, we call dependent plurals. You take unicorns, you take horns, and you spread them out in such a way that the uh, horn unicorn connection matches our understanding of what it means to be a unicorn. We can't do that with the unicorn. The unicorn has horns means each unicorn has more than one horn. Certainly we had unicycles, no way, right? Uh, and this one I'm less sure I took, I, so lions are widespread in many regions of the world, is fine. Uh, the lion is widespread, I made up this example, I might have seen it somewhere now, I didn't remember. I confirmed it with Larry, there's some resist. So, but regardless, I think these two are very strong, clear, Markers of a uh, grammatical distinction between the two. So that one was attested, that's, that, that second one there. The second one is. The line is widespread in many regions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, I think that's. Uh, I may have changed the many from this. I don't know. The many is also fine, yeah. Okay, so. I don't know why I put this up. I should have just stuck with the first two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but no. I like to. I like to point a few things that create controversy. But anyway, so the whole point in this exercise was to say that when we talk generic, when we talk high level abstract, it's very hard to see what the difference is. We have some felt differences, but then once you look at this grammatical, you know, there are these predicates that really don't like this kind of uh, uh, kind term, then you can, it seems reasonable to say, well, the web plural has some connection, with, some semantic connection with its uh, concrete object instantiations such that the grammar can access that, uh, those, um, um, those instantiations. And, you know, there's uh, the theory that I'm appealing to here is Kierkegaard's theory of kind terms, which is in the neo carsonian mode, so sort of the same, similar ideas, but just uh, captured in terms of these uh, operations from the kind level domain to the uh, individual level domain or object level domain. And what I'm saying is that those sorts of operations don't exist 
from the singular time term to the um, instantiation. It's conceptually the same, but grammatically not so. Okay, and let me draw an analogy here with a more familiar terrain, which is the terrain of ordinary individuals. In, the, in that talk too, you have these what are called collective terms or group terms that when you, they have slightly different properties from the entities that make up those terms, so team, bunch, or committee, and that's the example I have. So there are plural predicates like meet or gather that work with committee members or committee, so you can say the committee members will meet at 10, or the committee will meet at 10, and they're both acceptable, but you can't say, you, you can say the committee members like each other or live in different uh, cities, but not the committee likes each other. So this was the analogy I had in mind when I first started looking at these, and in, again, in this literature, there's a distinction made between sums of uh, plural individuals that are sums that allow you to talk about the individual parts dramatically, and groups that don't really allow you to do that. So you can see that it's pretty similar, this idea or the intuition that there's some mapping of things that are extensionally may be equivalent, but have a different status in, our, in the way we conceptualize them in the grammar. So, um, how do I think about these definite singular time terms? Basically, if you abstract away from the two that we're looking at, remember when we talked about the uh, indefinite singular, a tiger, we said a tiger is extinct is not good, except under a taxonomic reading. And now what are these taxonomic readings? Taxonomic readings, basically you can take any determiner in any language, okay, I don't know about that. Every language, English, let's English. <laughs> if that determiner works for the ordinary concrete level uh, uh, talk, it works also with these B extent, except that it's really talking not about ordinary individuals, but these steps. So that's what taxonomic domain means to me. That you have a determiner with its normal meaning, and instead of feeding it a uh, predicate of ordinary individuals, you're feeding it a predicate of taxonomic individuals, or individuals drawn from this higher taxonomic setup. But if every language, every determinant can do this, why not poor old girl? Why wouldn't girl also be able to do this? And what happens when you take the determinant the, which we believe is the IOTA operator that takes a unique uh, a set of entities, and if it it's a single term, it picks out that entity from that set. So when we say the African lion is a lion, we're looking at the set of lion subkinds. And if there's only a single term in the set that has the African lion properties, whatever they are, then that's what it refers to. But then similarly, what about the lion? Well, if you're looking at all the mammal kinds, and then you, you start plugging in each of those mammal individuals and say, which one of these is there a unique one here that fits the line, uh, set of line properties? Then you get what we call the definite singular generic. So this is sort of the idea that uh, I want to pursue. Basically, that there are two types of, two ways of forming kinds in English. One is that looks at predicates, and you know if there's enough generalizations of the right kind, it then creates a kind term using let's call it norm. It could be something else, but there's some operation that goes from a predicate of individuals to the abstract level. And it is the number of corresponding um, operation that goes in the other direction. And then there's this other operator. Uh, the, sorry, the operator is the same. It's iota. And different languages may lexicalize it or not lexicalize it, but we all have to have a way of picking out unique individuals. So iota is pretty. It's a nice one, we like it, okay? But when IOTA applies to the ordinary domain, we get what we think of as a definite reading, the ordinary definite reading. When it applies to this taxonomic domain, then we get this definite singular generic, as it's called. So, yeah, so this is the end of the first section. And so then I'm thinking, so this idea I've had for some time, and I've always just steered clear of this you know, when it comes right, so are there 
what's the ontological status of these two kinds? I don't really know. And so I started looking at some of the literature, and there's a lot of work, uh, mostly by Sarah Jane Leslie and her collaborators, and Sandeep Prasad and his collaborators, and I think some collaborators might even be in this room. And they make very important distinctions between how uh, kind terms or generic terms relate to uh, the, the statistical generalizations versus the principal generalizations, or the default. So Sarah Jane Leslie talks about the cognitive mechanism that is involved in generic quantification being somehow the default one. And I'm not taking issue with that, but I'm not sure how that helps me understand these two levels of, you know, two ways of thinking about kinds. Or two ways not just thinking, actually I don't know about the thinking, I know that there are two ways of expressing kinds in natural language, at least in English, that's what we've seen so far. So, so now we move on to, so this is what we see in English, and it could be just a random fact about English, but in fact, if you look across the world's languages, the small subset that I know of, what you find, let's separate out those languages between those that mark number on their, um, in their nominal domain and those that don't, and let's set that aside for a moment. So when we look at English, we see this difference, but the difference morphologically is along two dimensions. Their plurals do not overtly signal definiteness, and they're plural. And the definite singular signals definiteness in a thing. So which is which is critical, the number or the definiteness marking? And um, this is where I think taking a cross-linguistic perspective, um, you know, gives you some different questions, raise different questions. So, um, yeah, so let me just, I was going to pose a question to the class, but I decided against it, <laughs> because I'm not sure how much time I have. <laughs> okay, so let's look at three languages, English, Italian, and Hindi, as a way of separating out some possibilities. So what we see in English is that the plural is bare, and the singular is definite. We see in Italian that they're both definite. You can have a definite singular, not can. You must have a definite plural and a definite singular to express the same readings. English, of course, has definite plurals, but we don't use them to refer to kinds, right? And then Hindi, because it doesn't have determiners, uses bare plural and bare singular. So there are lots of generalizations here, and I'm not going to talk about all of them. But let me read some of the generalizations that are not, I think they're generalizations about how natural language works, because there could be other generalizations that are not attested. So languages do not have a dedicated time determiner. It's either bare or it's definite. Why is this important? Like, we don't have a problem with having more lexical like, you know, I don't know how many determiners are there. You can look up Marwais and Cooper. There's, it comes through that they had to shrink the typeface, right? You look at all of them on one page. So why not one more? You could have had a kind determiner. Every language uses kinds, you know, wants to talk about kind, but we don't. But even more telling is that when it does want a determiner, let's say for syntactic reasons, Rafaela wants to use DPs. She will not have NPs that type shift. <laughs> well, the determiner that she wants to use is a definite. It's not, it could be something, why not all? You know? But the kind terms are always either definite or fair, and to me that says something. I'm not sure what, but it does. Um, and then when a language has number distinction, again, you could very happily live with, you know, why would I waste energy talking about kind in two different ways, but they all do, which is not true for languages that don't mark number. So there are languages like Mandarin, Korean, Japanese, Bangla, etc., that whose base form is neutral with respect to number, right? It could refer to one or it could refer to more. And often they have a special marker for plurality that is strictly plural often. And very, most, at least the ones that I've read, there's one in Bangla that allows kind reference, but mostly they do not allow kind reference. So the fact that if you have two, you will use them both for kind reference is not a given. 
But if you mark number, then you still, you always get both. And that's interesting too. Finally, languages with definite determinants always use the definite for the singular. So, if you have a definite determiner, you may or may not have parent these. But if you have a definite determinant, there will be a definite singular generic in your language. That's uh, the generalization we have. And finally, there's also some correlation. You can have, a def if you have a definite plural kind term, you must have a definite singular kind term. So the baseline is the singular, definite. Then when it comes to the plural, you may or may not. Of course, you can have languages that don't, don't have determinants at all. How many doing for time? Who's keeping track? I yeah, you're fine. Half <laughs> 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 an hour has gone past. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, no problem. I'm, I'm at the end. So this is so here's uh, Leslie 2007. So most of the work that I've seen, a lot of the work that I've seen is English centric, but Leslie, uh, I forget. It, um, it's more than. So Leslie has pushed this idea that we have this default uh, cognitive mechanism that does not involve overt quantification, even when you have these tripartite structures. But in a way, the absence of a kind level determiner, I don't think, follows quite from that. Because, although I think maybe she does. But the point is this, that this is about reference to kinds. Genericity could be derivative of that. And so, you know, I think that it doesn't quite match it. So, uh, so that, okay. So why do we have definite and um, pair? I don't have such a good answer for why we have pair and these uh, pair kind terms in languages like um, that have definite determiners. But if you look at the operations, they are built up out of iota in some form. These are the operations that we will look at now and iota. And so the fact that it uses the lexicalized, if a language has lexicalized iota, that's the definite determiner, that's how we call, that's why we call it a definite determiner, then it's not a surprise that it should use that for definite singular terms. So that's sort of the idea that the variation between bare and definite rather than something else comes from the nature of the kind forming operations that we have. Okay. Um, so yeah, so this is one thing we could talk about. You look across these languages, and there's some things that are due to number, and something that are due to definiteness. So all of the languages that have web, uh, that have plural kind terms show no restriction to well-established kinds. So they all are completely happy with barns with red roofs or three-legged tigers. Whether you're speaking in a Romance language that must put in a definite, or whether you're speaking English that or Hindi that doesn't have a definite of that, and English definite singulars, Hindi bare singulars. So now this is what this is again about number. When it comes to um, well-established kind, they all show the same propensity again, regardless of definiteness marking. So this idea that the operation that takes you from entities, a set of ordinary entities, to the kind level term that's true for English bare plurals is really about number. So for various reasons. Uh, Given the time, I won't go over it. We can discuss it later. But the idea is that norm is defined on plural terms, and therefore doesn't matter the definiteness is language specific. But what is due to definiteness marking is the fact that you have uh, um, that there's some history. So take a language like Italian, and I hope I did. I sometimes make mistakes copying it, but. Anyway, so take a language like Italian or Spanish, when you have two, uh, they, they look like bare plurals, functionally equivalent to bare plurals, if you're only looking at kind terms and generic term, uh, generic statements. I haven't seen any real difference. Uh, uh, but when you talk about existential readings, so bare plurals, we haven't talked about this, but you can also use bare plurals to talk about ordinary episodic uh, events, right? So, Dogs are barking outside. Basically means some dogs. But if you're speaking Italian, you cannot use the same kind term that you used for generic or for kind, uh, kind level statements. You cannot use it for episodic statements. So this is where the two come apart. And 
if you look at Hindi and what do Hindi and English have in common that um, uh, kind terms have in common as opposed to Italian, it's that it's not overtly marked definite, right? Whereas the Italian is um, uh, where plural, I mean, definite plural has an overt mark of definiteness. So we can put that, that down to the presuppositions of the definite determinable lexical item. And uh, yeah, so this was the article I was thinking about earlier, where uh, Kelman, Tapia, and Leslie, they found that actually it was, they were testing, does length make a difference? So, you know, Spanish speakers had the same exact way of uh, interpreting or uh, uh, responding to plural kind terms with the definite as opposed to bare plurals in English. And, this is taken as uh, evidence of it being a uh, cognitive default. Um, but you, again, I feel like from the linguistic point of view, yeah, they may be the same, but then why did they come apart in episodic context? So it doesn't address that. It wasn't trying to, but I'm saying to me those, are que those questions are important. And in fact, I'm in Montreal and Santos have actually done uh, ask them. From the cross-linguistic perspective, they asked a lot, a uh, lot more interesting questions. It seems to me, and what they found, things that I mentioned already, that well-defined kinds was not so. Oh yeah, they look at Brazilian Portuguese, which is an interesting language, because it has all four possibilities. Versing, vers, uh, vers singular. There's one here. Mm -hmm. Vers singulars, vers plurals, definite singulars, definite plurals. There's a huge discussion at the empirical level, forget the theoretical level, about what is the status of the Brazilian pair singular. Does it refer to kinds or does it not refer to kinds? But so they say, uh, their finding was that it doesn't refer to kinds. But from, just to pick out two generalizations that follow from the theory, one is that the plurals, both singular, uh, both uh, um, bear and definite, showed no propensity to well-established kinds, no restriction. And the second was that since it has a definite article, the singular has to have the definite article. Not has to is where people may differ. I don't know which side do you follow? Doesn't have to. Doesn't have to. <laughs> so there are people who get very singular denoting kinds. So setting that aside, the point is, if that's uh, the taxonomic, uh, the taxonomic approach to singular kind terms is right. What it, that is saying is iota is involved, and if iota is lexicalized, well, it should be seen. And so I think there's no argument that the definite singular is a kind term, and that's the part that I think is predicted by looking at the linguistic theory too. Yeah. Okay. Where are we for time? I'm on the last. I don't know. You're, you're like ten minutes. Oh, yeah, ten minutes. I will pass. <laughs> then I <need> more questions. <laughs> Okay, so we looked at, um, now I'm transitioning to the third phase, which is what is the status of the indefinite reading? So we looked at kind level readings, we looked at generic readings, and we saw that they pattern the forms, the morphological forms pattern together. We already had some indication that when we get to the uh, episodic level where you get the indefinite reading, the existential reading, the things, the, the languages that use a definite kind of go their own way. So now I'm looking at the languages that allow for bare and peace. So Italian and Romance languages we set aside, but we introduce a new player, which is Mandarin. Yeah, I did my best. <laughs> so uh, now we look at Mandarin, for example, and uh, English and Hindi. These are languages that differ on their number, how they encode number in the noun phrase, but they all allow for bare and peace, either as a, an option, as in English, or as, you know, we don't have a definite determinant, so what are we going to do? Not talk? Okay, so <laughs> the point here is uh, Miles wants to be policeman. So Carlson made this point early on, and I think it's a very important point. Some of it gets missed sometimes, is that bear, it's true that bear non phrase, bear in peace, bear plurals in English, have indefinite readings. But they're not the same readings as the ones you get with overt indefinites. Not only are they, uh, and, and furthermore, they're not a subtype of an indefinite. So it's not like a strong weak. 
There are readings that verb plurals have that indefinites cannot have. So they are distinct. So the first one is where there's a subset of Miles, Miles wants to mean policeman. It could be any policeman. Say they different. Miles wants to mean a policeman or some policeman. They could be specific ones or just any, maybe harder with some, but I think you can make it work. But the second one is more important. There's a whole slew of them. I just picked up one. Miles killed rabbits for three days. <laughs> a little boring, but he was killing different, you know, for whatever reason. He killed them. Different sets of rabbits, right? So it's not one rabbit. But if say Maya kills some rabbits for three days, that really means, I don't know what it means, but it's not happy thoughts I'm getting. <laughs> a set of rabbits that, it's a very prolonged. <laughs> Why is this important? It's important because it shows you that bear plurals have the ability to, however you get this existential reading, it's very low. It's the lowest possible, even lower than the syntax of English, for whatever reason, does not allow this adverbial for three uh, uh, days to take scope over, scope over an indefinite. Weak, strong, doesn't matter. Okay. So this, is, this was kind of one of his big arguments for saying these indefinite readings are really derivative of times. And again, we can talk about different operations, but it's once you get from the kind to its instantiations, you existentially quantify over them. But you do it sort of at the last minute, like after you've composed everything, and you of it that way. They, so Pirke's uh, DKP, direct time predication, is a rule that introduces this existential quantification as a sort of, as a repair operation or something. So for this part, now we're switching to languages like Hindi, Mandarin, and if I asked, if I just asked, even in this room, um, so what do you think bearing these in these languages mean? I think the answer uh, is going to be ambiguous. They could be definite and or indefinite. Kind of makes sense. And it is true to some extent. So, you know, people have speculated why this should be the case. And uh, they're reasonable, reasonable speculations. But this is not what the ground reality is. Or at least let me push a strong version of my of the ground reality. Um, and Paula is here, she can correct me if it's wrong. But this is what happens. Take Hindi. Hindi variant please have definite readings. So we have tests, we have, we have diagnostics, it can participate in an AFRA, it can um, have maximality impl implications, etc. Hindi bed plurals do not have bona fide indefinite readings, just like English bed plurals. Um, but they do allow narrow scope in definite readings, just like, so they really, the bare plurals behave the same. Even the bare singulars do not have indefinite readings, except in some specific contexts, such as direct object positions. So this is a key point, which is very hard, you know, because we hear things said and we don't always pay attention to is this plural, is it singular, but if you focus on the singular and you move away from the direct object position, you start seeing that it's really, it gives you the feeling of a definite, very often, uh, more than often. Of course, Mandarin doesn't have singular terms, so Mandarin bear plurals behave like English, uh, Mandarin bear nominals behave like English bear plurals. They have definite readings, that's the extra reading that these languages, the bear and peace have. And they have also have these very narrow scope readings, not wide scope readings. Okay. So, how do we interpret their endings? When we don't see something in there, one big discussion in the linguistic literature is, is this an NP or is it a DP? And in some sense, I think the issue is independent of that. So, if you have a DP, you have to posit a null D. If you have an NP, you have to posit type shift. But the issue is, if you have a null D, what is its meaning? What I, are you going to say is iota? Are you going to say it's the existential type shift? You have to say something because it's not. If you could get anything, any meaning whatsoever, then it wouldn't matter so much. So in the type shift literature, there's this proposal that you, all type shifts are not randomly or arbitrarily equally available. 
So you don't just choose, I have a noun, I have a predicative term, I want to make it an argument. Let's tap into IOTA and get a definite reading. Let's tap into the existential, get an indefinite reading. Because then you would get, you know, by the scope reading, you would get exactly what you get with in overt indefinites. So this is the ranking. So another interesting thing is a language that doesn't have definite determinants, there's no competition ever between the kind reading and the definite reading. You always get both. But there's some competition there. So that's what that's trying to do. And the, so why does English not have definite determinants? I mean, clearly it's the presence of those. So once you've lexicalized it, you don't tap into this. So there's got to be something like that. Um, okay. Moving on. So where does this idea that uh, web, uh, these languages are, have pair, pair nominals that are indefinite, uh, that are ambiguous come from? It's examples like that, where you have a direct object. So Anu Kitap or Rayanu's reading book can be in the right context, the book or a book. And that's why people do, I mean, there's reason why that is. But then I kind of tried to get this from your abstract, maybe not from your talk. But if you have a scenario where you have dog on the bed, you want to use one to, refer, to introduce. Again, it's a tendency. But notice this is not a, a wide scope, narrow scope thing. It's simply can you use this narrow scope existential to introduce an entity. It's slightly different. But still, there's a, there's a tendency to use one here. And it's completely acceptable to use the bare entity to refer back. So, What's special about the direct object position? Why do we get this flexibility in the, just that position? Well, direct objects are very special, and I think it's extremely easy to conceive of them as a complex predicate. So, uh, you know, and the tests that people have done to show that even in languages that don't morphologically show incorporation, this is what uh, is called pseudo incorporation, it's as if they are uh, denoting a unified activity. So book reading. You have to tell me time now? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm not very mindful of that. <laughs> so okay. so in cooperation, um, yeah. So this is an interesting, so I came into this literature, I've always had this um, thought of, uh, or one thing that every, so you know, everybody knows about people who are learning, whose first language doesn't have determiners and who learn languages with determiners is that they never quite get it right, they're learning pretty early. And so this, is, uh, this has been documented and experimentally tested. But when you look at the L2 literature, the premise always is that the bare NP in the base language is ambiguous. And that leaves, so I think, um, so I'm not presenting, you know, I'm not rushing to publication with this, okay? But there still are some telltale observations in this literature that make you wonder if it's really, if what we're doing is using our L1 knowledge of a determinerless language where bare entries could be definite, could be indefinite, depending on the context you interpret it properly, why should they, there are some observations that don't fit that. And here too, and I'm cherry picking, I, I'll tell you that, okay? But uh, many, Okay, so this is a, uh, uh, I think these are younger children who are still, uh, it's L2 acquisition at a younger, uh, of young kids. And the ones, so many more cases of definite article omission among subjects whose L1 did not have article. So Chinese, Hindi, Urdu, Punjabi, those three they put in one category. Their omission of the definite article, where there should have been a definite article, was much higher than of the, kids who were coming from Spanish and Arabic. And if you think about it, a bare NP in Hindi or in the other, all these languages can be definite. So when they see a bare NP in a definite context, it doesn't ruffle their feathers, they happily move on. So this is not surprising in and of itself if, if it was equally matched with the ability to drop uh, um, indefinite articles. But they pick up the definite for this, right? Okay, and on the indefinite, this was another interesting point, that in the misuse of articles, there was virtually no difference between the four groups. 
So what is it about the indefinite article? The L1 doesn't have an indefinite article, right? So why is it that they're so good at it? So then one has to ask, <laughs> how do we know it doesn't have an indefinite article? Because we have one, we can reduce one. But it's true that one, uh, so English, Hindi, A, behaves like English one, plus a little bit of a softening of one. It does not really behave like a uh, in the sense that you can't make generic statements with it. Like a dog, a cow eats grass. You couldn't say what cow eats grass, even if you unstress it. So it's not an indefinite article, yet its uses are close enough that it seems to me that the, the L2 learner just maps on what they do with one to a uh, and gets, you know, gets a lot of, they don't misuse it. And so this mismatch between the and er is telling. And one last point. Um, so in one of the articles that uh, deal with this literature, they talk of it as a virtue that they are only looking at the direct object position. <laughs> and you know, I think it's good to control for that. But then that's the place where, of course, they are ambiguous, and so you do get these uh, results. So what we are doing um, is trying to uh, vary the position and see if there's a difference in L to L position. And the preliminary results seems to suggest that you know they, this uh, does matter. So, am I? Uh, yeah. Okay. Last slide. So basically, I just want to step back and you know tie the three pieces together. And what I want to say is basically there have been two major landmarks in our from the linguistic side in our understanding of uh, of uh, kind terms, so generosity more broadly construed. One was, as I mentioned, Carlson's work on English that gave an explicit account of how we go from one to the other, what what it takes to be, a, or in what ways is quantification with web rules different from, different from other kinds of quantification. The second landmark, I think, was here Kier who articulated a theory of cross-linguistic variation. What could vary and what could not vary. And um, obviously, you know, it, in uh, neither of these landmarks actually got it right, because if they got it right, we, there would be nothing left to do. But they opened up new ways of thinking about it. And uh, you know, cross-linguistic semantics is relatively new in the field, 90s, right? But already we see that the questions you ask and the answers you get tell us something. Um, I think it's interesting both linguistically, but also what it can tell us about how humans conceive of different um, things and how they express it in language. So thank you. Then after the, after the session, uh, uh, Vinita is also going to be sitting with the other speakers, so, and so there will be plenty of opportunity to ask for questions. Larry? This, that was really great. Uh, I, I just wanted to touch on one point in support of your observation about the mistake that people make in predicting that um, bare plurals should be in, in uh, that, that sorry that singulars in languages without articles should be ambiguous, uh, uh, and that the the problem is that they look specifically at direct object position, which favors the uh, uh, the indefinite reading. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned pseudo incorporation, so a, a corollary of that is the fact that even in languages which have over article marking. Um, direct uh, objects that are formally definite um, can be neither um, uh, familiar nor unique. Uh, and of course, I'm talking about the, the weak definite, which Carlson and his yes. colleagues also look at uh, phenomena. So, so uh, uh, you need to see the doctor uh, about that. Or uh, I read that in the paper. I heard that on the radio. And we know from uh, a lot of research that there's a lot of variation and conventionalization in terms of which um, nominals and predicates lend themselves to those readings. So the doctor, you need mm -hmm. to see the doctor, you need to see the nurse. 
but the, the idea there is that um, you know that, that you you tend to get those weak definite readings primarily in direct object position, and indeed the pseudo incorporation approach, rather than saying it's a, it's an indefinite for some reason, seems to be the the most plausible. So you need to doctor C basically, yeah, yeah. or a newspaper read mm -hmm. that is yeah. the sense you get, not syntactically, but you know, uh, yeah. semantically, pragmatically. Right. So. You wouldn't get, let's say, the newspaper kept being delivered right, right. all day, kind yeah. of. You know, if you create context where they are not, not likely to be pseudo. I there's a little discomfort I have with the pseudo incorporation idea for uh, weak definites, but I think I should get over those discomforts. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the right one. So. Yeah. Um, that was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Um, so I want to ask about the status of the, the generalization you've asserted many times that a singular indefinite cannot have a generic meaning. So a dog has four legs has to mean you're thinking about a particular dog. Uh, no. So in the generic, that's a generic statement, right? Yeah. And on, in a generic statement, it does have. A kind reading. A kind reading, yes. Oh. It doesn't have a kind, it, you cannot predicate something that only goes with kinds of an input. Let me get back to the slides so it will be a little easier. Uh, this one, yeah. So, this, so the idea is that there's some kind of quantification. No, um, nobody really knows what this gen operator, how exactly to model it, but something like every normal, typical, most, there are many ways to cash it out. That can take a tiger. So when you have that kind of a tripartite structure and you say, let's say you say most, most x such that x is a tiger, so that works for the example you gave, but it would not work on that one, on the kind no, of also, So I want to tell you another way it doesn't mm -hmm. work. Yeah. Uh, and the question is how it interacts with this. Mm -hmm. So this is Prasada's work, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so, if, so not only is there a difference between generics in terms of how well established they are, mm -hmm. there's a very big difference in the ways in which predicates uh -huh. license generics. Uh -huh. So, so a tiger has stripes or a right. dog has four legs is fine on a generic reading mm -hmm. because in Sandeep's, yes. but this goes back to Aristotle and Marat, yeah, yeah. and Shia, you know, mm -hmm. lots of other people, um, uh, that property mm -hmm. um, is principally connected to right. the kind yeah. or is a formal connection to the kind. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Sweden, all barns are red. Mm -hmm. And that's because the, there is a anti-mold chemical in the that, red, the red yeah, right? yeah. So it's a merely statistical generalization. Right. But even in Sweden, you, you cannot can. say a barn is red and have a generic reading. Right. right? So, there, so, so there's another restriction that, that has to do mm -hmm. with the essential well, principle was a statistical, right? right. Well, that is yeah. what yeah. kind of predicate it is, not, yeah. Yeah. not just what kind of kind it is. Yeah, exactly, yes. So, thank you. That, there's, of course, a lot of stuff that I didn't uh, go into. So, I said that an indefinite cannot be a kind term, and cannot be a kind level predication. There is one caveat, though. So, suppose, you know, there's two things we know about definite and definite marking. There's also a given new distinction, right? And so, suppose, uh, and this is Bart Burke's uh, example. And you say, oh, my uncle uh, invented, so invent is something that takes kind terms. My uncle invented the light bulb. Okay, so you must be rich. Uh, but you can also say, oh, you know, <laughs> my uncle invented a pumpkin crusher this morning or yesterday or recently. Now, a pumpkin crusher is not something that's part of our world knowledge, I assume. And so if it's a novel kind, then because English makes this distinction between the and uh, you can use a, 
but that is different, so I just muddied the water a little bit. But I think what Sue is pointing out is absolutely right, that these have to be, uh, when you use a, it's going to have the same kind of principled connection to the kind, so it's somewhat definitional or essential property, in the same way that earlier I said, you know, that the type of the definite singular has that too. So I don't think we can, you know, I'm not quite sure how to connect these dots, but there are some dots to be connected, even between the, which is a full-blown kind term, and a, n, which is not. Um, and that would be exactly the place to look at. Why does a want more principal connection than not? Thank you. That's it. For now. For now. <laughs>